Well, if our society had a default mode, it would be distrust. If you look at just where we're at as a country, the distrust levels are through the roof. All right, so let me give you some examples for how this is the case for us right now. Gallup reports that we have the lowest level of trust in major U.S. institutions ever. This is like Supreme Court and the other 16 that would be considered the major U.S. institutions. Y'all, 248 years as a country and our distrust in our institutions are at its all-time low right now. That's crazy. Pew Research backs this up. They say that two-thirds of adults state a distrust, not just in institutions, but in our government at large. This is the largest it's ever been. And what's even more alarming, besides like distrust in institutions, some of us are like, yeah, well, we're young. We distrust everything, right? Well, it's alarming that our interpersonal distrust is at an all-time high. 64% of adults say they don't even trust their own neighbor. Like, that is shocking. 64%. And what we need to understand, even with all this distrust in what seems like outward, even more so who the person that's like maybe most not exempt to our distrust is God himself. We have a deep distrust, not just in institutions, but even in the deity of the whole entire world. Here are the most Googled questions um, that people pose about God. There's a list of them that we can look at together on the screen. The first one, why does God allow suffering and evil? I mean, every single one of us have thought this at some point, right? Does life have a purpose? We want our life to go in a direction. Does our life have any purpose? This is ultimately a God question. Does God even exist? Like, is he still there? Is the Bible reliable? This thing's been around for so long. Is it just dated? Can I continue to trust in what is supposedly the truth that it contains? Can I know God personally? I don't want just the God that's out there. I want a God that I can actually know, and I know who knows me. Like, Here's what is the underlying theme of all these questions. The question that underlies all of them is, can I trust God? That's what is at the root of every single one of these questions that's Googled by probably some of us in this room. And here's what the Bible and human witness both say in answer to this question. It's a resounding yes. Here's what Psalm 36.5 says. Lord, your faithful Love reaches to the heavens. All right, just stop there. <laughs> the heavens, the skies, the ones that we are using as many human resources to try to go and explore, even God's love is beyond what we can even comprehend or even begin to imagine to explore within our own, our own humanness. Your faithfulness to the clouds. This is written by King David. If anybody had reason to doubt because of adversity in their life, it would be King David. He had people, his whole entire nation was seeking out his life. And here he is in thir Psalm 36.5 declaring the faithful love of God. A.W. Pink um, is another Christian author he struggled in his life with health and social issues, literally had to flee different parts of where he lived because of the social distrust that was happening in his life. Here's what he says about God. Everything about God is great, vast, incomparable. He never forgets. He never fails. He never falters. He never forfeits his word to every declaration of promise or prophecy, speaking of like the threats that God gives towards the human sin and the continued in human sin, has exactly adhered. Every engagement of covenant, the relationship that God makes with us or threatening against sin, he will make good. Both the Bible and human witness declare that God is faithful and can be trusted. These are huge claims regarding the faithfulness and the trustworthiness of God. 
Yet even with this, <laughs> we want a little bit more, don't we? When it comes to God's trustworthiness, we don't want abstract art. We want figurative art. We want God's trustworthiness and faithfulness to be real, not imaginative. Something that just happens with somebody else, but we want to experience it in our life too, don't we? I mean, like, you're with me, right? Like, this is our human experience. When it comes to our relationship with God, can I trust him? Well, tonight, the story that we're looking at makes God's faithfulness real not imaginative for us. Last week we looked at Joseph's faithfulness to God. We looked at how Joseph in the most adverse times in his life practiced fortitude, which we defined as courage with endurance. It wasn't just a one-time act. This was his regular practice. He continued out of trust in God to act out of courage, and it was the continued practice of his life. We see that he served When he could have given himself to self-pity, no one else could have compared to the wrongs that were done to Joseph in his life. He could have wallowed in self-pity, yet he decided to sacrificially serve when it was fun and when it was hard. And then he was also patient. Joseph was forgotten. Years of being in service, being a slave, or being imprisoned wrongfully, Joseph patiently waited for the right time that God was going to bring the promises in his life to fruition. Yet this week, in Genesis 41, we will see that God has been faithful to Joseph all along. Joseph is faithful for about 10 years, 12 years, being faithful to God. What we're going to find is that God has been faithful the whole entire time. And here's how we're going to see God's faithfulness to Joseph. We're going to see that God goes before Joseph. We're going to see that God stands with Joseph. And then we're going to see that God even walks behind Joseph. And as we look through these three different parts of God's faithfulness tonight, here's my prayer for us. I want every single one of you to leave this place confident, that you can trust God and that he is faithful to you in the high times and the fair times and the low times. And then here's how we're going to end. We're not just go- I don't want you to just leave with this confidence. I want us to celebrate it. I want us to look at God's faithfulness in the face tonight. And then I want us to rejoice with celebrating. We have two ways that we're going to do that. And I'll <clears throat> share that with you by the end of the night. All right. So God is faithful. Let's look at it. So God goes before Joseph. We see this in the first part of the story. Rachel just read it for us, so let me re, uh, rehash it for us as we dive in. Here's what we see. Joseph, at the end of Genesis 40, is still in prison. He's still in prison at the beginning of Genesis 41. The cupbearer forgot Joseph even after he interpreted his dreams. The cupbearer returns to his rightful position, yet he forgets Joseph for two whole years. And in Genesis 41, what you see happen is that Pharaoh has a couple of dreams. If you look throughout the life of Joseph, dreams always come in twos. Joseph has two dreams. While he's in prison, the cupbearer and the baker have dreams, two dreams, Pharaoh Here has two dreams. In the first dream, Pharaoh is approached by seven healthy and seven sickly cows by the Nile River. This is the main source, resource for all of Egypt. And as Pharaoh is standing at the river, seven healthy cows come and then seven sickly cows come. And then what happens is the seven sickly cows eat the seven healthy cows. This was a gruesome, grotesque dream. This isn't just like a cartoon where the cows are swallowed up in whole. It would have been a bloody mess. Pharaoh wakes up and he's troubled and he goes back to sleep. In the second dream, you have seven good heads of grain that sprout up and then seven bad heads of grain sprout up and they eat the first seven. This would have been alarming to Pharaoh as he's the top of not just Egypt, the world. 
He feels the weight of providing, and then he sees these resources. And so he wakes up, and he's troubled by these dreams. And so he summons the most wise and understanding men that are in his entire kingdom. Magicians, wise men come in, yet they cannot interpret the dreams. Pharaoh knows because he's troubled that there is significance to them, but he can't get the answer. And then it dawns on the cupbearer, that guy in prison. And here's what we find in verse, at the end of verse 9 through 14. Here's what the cupbearer says, Today I remember my faults. Pharaoh was angry with his servants, and he put me and the chief cupbearer or baker in the custody of the captain of the guards. He and I had dreams on the same night. Each dream had its own meaning. Now a young Hebrew, a slave of the captain of the guards, was with us there. We told him our dreams. He interpreted our dreams for us, and each had its own interpretation. And it turned out just the way he interpreted them for us. I was restored to my position, and the other man was hanged. Then look at the urgency with Pharaoh here. This shows you just how troubled he was by these dreams. Then Pharaoh sent for Joseph, and they quickly brought him from the dungeon. He shaved, changed his clothes, and went to Pharaoh. It's in these first 14 verses that we see that God goes before Joseph. We see this in two particular ways. First, we see that God creates an opportunity for Joseph through his dreams. God is the conspirator behind the entire scene. I mean, think about this. God gives Pharaoh the dream, and then he renders it uncomprehensible. Now, if that's us, we're like, that's like, that's awful. <laughs> How mean of God that he would supply a dream and then he wouldn't provide the interpretations for it. God knows Pharaoh. He knows that by providing these dreams that it's going to trouble Pharaoh's heart. He's not going to stop until he can find out an answer of what these particular dreams mean. And at the same time, God ensures that no one in Pharaoh's entire land can interpret what they mean. God both supplies and withholds the dreams and its interpretations look to create an opportunity for Joseph. He's the one person. Secondly, God delivers Joseph through the cupbearer. This is another way that God goes before Joseph. After two years, God brings to the cupbearer's mind Joseph. In the midst of all of the chaos, the cupbearer after two years. I mean, many of us can't remember things that happened two days ago. And the cupbearer comes to mind. Joseph comes to mind. The cupbearer shares about how Joseph helped him in prison. I was in this same predicament, Pharaoh. And this man that I met in the prison, he told me what happened in my dreams. Everything came to fruition just as he told it. And with the snap of Pharaoh's fingers, Pharaoh sends for this man in the prison, brings Joseph out of the prison to the palace. And it's all because God recalls the cupbearer's memory. Look, I need you to notice one more thing. What is Joseph's hand in any of this? Where is he? He's off in prison. Joseph has no leverage in terms of how he is putting something into Pharaoh's head, how he's recalling his own story in the cupbearer's mind. Joseph is in prison, helpless and without any control. And what God does is he goes before Joseph and he creates an opportunity for him, God goes before Joseph. Look, here's what God is telling us through this story. You can trust God with your future. God goes before Joseph and does what is completely out of Joseph's control. He has no say in what happens here, but God goes before Joseph, 
creates an opportunity for him, recalls Joseph to mind in the cupbearer's head, and he provides the way. God provides for Joseph in his future and what God, through Joseph's story, is telling you is you can trust him with your future too. Here's what Proverbs 3 has to say. Proverbs 3, 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Listen to this. Acknowledge him in all your ways, and he shall direct your paths. Here, basically, here's what Proverbs 3, 5 is telling you. You can trust God with the unknown. The things that you do not have an answer for in your life, you're wondering and you're anxious about how things are going to happen in your future. What Joseph's story tells us is that you can trust God with that unknown because you have a God who goes before you. Now, here's what we need to understand when it comes to our future, all right? A lot of us get anxious about our future. What we need to see here is that Joseph has direction, all right? At 17, God gives Joseph a couple of dreams. He declares these dreams. He knows that this is what God is placing before him in terms of his future. Joseph has direction. He just doesn't know how it's going to come to fruition, Some of us are really anxious about our future. Some of us, it's because we don't have direction. What you need to go and do is wrestle with God in prayer about what God's direction is for your life. For some of us, we are anxious because we have direction, but we don't know how it's going to come to fruition. You also have a God that if you go and you trust him and you do what Proverbs 3, 5 says, is that you acknowledge him with all of your ways, that in every single step, as you're trying to make steps and have direction in your life, you are following the commands of Scripture and you're trusting in his provision in your life that God is going to be the one that is going to work out what seems to be completely unknown and he's going to make a way for your future. Look. Because you have a God that goes before you. So look, with all that seems to be like so vague, it seems like that abstract art. You're like, I don't, it seems just so out there in space. What the Bible is telling is you can take a deep breath. Because just the way that God goes before Joseph, he goes before every single one that's trusted in Christ Jesus too. And he will make your paths straight. This is the Bible's testimony. This is Christian's testimony. I mean, here's what I would charge you to do. Anyone that is young in the room, go and ask someone older in the room, how has God provided for you in what seemed to be completely unknown? I guarantee you will have a story. If you follow Jesus, he will continue to unpack things. Look, there's things in my life that God has, what's felt like it was going to be unknown, has made paths straight by just taking one step at a time, trusting that he's going to be the one that provides. Look, my family moved to St. Louis with the hopes of starting a church. We had no funds. We had no people. We had no place. We had no idea how this was going to happen. And then look where we are tonight. Like God is faithful. And you can trust him. God goes before Joseph. He goes before you too. In the same way, God goes before Joseph. He goes before you. It will look different and you can trust him. And then next sequence, you don't see that he just goes before you, but you also see that God stands with Joseph. This is what we see in verses 15 through 49. So Joseph is rushed to Pharaoh from prison. Pharaoh shares his dreams. I've heard it said about you that you can hear a dream and interpret it. Here's how Joseph responds to Pharaoh. I mean, this is the the king. This is the most powerful person in the whole world. And here's how Joseph responds to him. I'm not able to Not settling a lot of confidence, right? It is God who will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. And so Pharaoh retells his dreams to Joseph. I was standing at the Nile. 
the seven cows come that are healthy, then the seven sickly, and the seven sickly eat the healthy, then the seven healthy heads of grain were eaten by the seven bad heads of grain in the second one, second dream. And Pharaoh concludes, I told this to the magicians, but no one can tell me what it means. And then Joseph steps in. (laughs) Joseph interprets the dreams for Pharaoh. He says essentially the two dreams are one. The seven cows and the seven grains all stand for the same thing. They're talking about seven years. The seven, or the good and the bad when it comes to the cows and the grain are talking about years of abundance and they're talking about years of famine. And so God has shown Pharaoh that there will be seven years of abundance and seven years of famine. The years of famine will overwhelm the land to where no one remembers that there was an abundance. That's how hard famine would hit the land. And here's what Joseph says. He says, because the dream occurred twice, God is determined that this is going to happen. There's no changing his hand. So Joseph then does the unthinkable. He doesn't just interpret the dreams for Pharaoh. He then gives Pharaoh a plan. He's like, here's what you need to do. Appoint one who is discerning and wise to oversee the land. They should take a fifth of the harvest during the years of abundance, store it into to cities, and then preserve it for the seven years of famine. And this will keep the country from being wiped out by famine. How would Pharaoh respond? That would have to be what Joseph is wondering. Is he stepping in? He's taking another moment of courage. He's showing he has fortitude, courage with endurance. And here's how Pharaoh responds. The proposal pleased Pharaoh and all his servants. Verse 38. And he said to them, can we, this is talking about the magicians and the wise men that are around him. Can we find anyone like this? He's like looking around at them and he's like, you fools couldn't even do this. Can we find anybody else that can do this? A man who has God's spirit in him? So Pharaoh said to Joseph, he redirects his attention. Since God has made all this known to you, there is no one as discerning and as wise as you are. You will be over my house and all my people will obey your commands. A Hebrew amongst Egyptians, my people are going to submit to you. Only I as king will be greater than you. Pharaoh also said to Joseph, see, I'm placing you over all the land of Egypt. Do you see what's happening here? (laughs) Pharaoh removed his signet ring from his hand, which is the seal that anything that Joseph touches, the command of Pharaoh follows, and put it on Joseph's hand, clothed him with fine linen garments. He was in prison that morning and placed a gold chain around his neck. He had Joseph ride in his second chariot, and servants called out before him, make way. When the servants go proclaim this, it's charging that people bend to the knee. Do do you see it? (laughs) So he placed him over all the land of Egypt, Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and no one will be able to raise his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt without your permission. The rest of the story records that everything went just as Joseph said it would. Seven years of abundance came. Joseph stored up a fifth of all that came in. Then the seven years of famine hit. And Joseph had prepared Egypt for this travesty. And there was so much that was stored up that it said it was too much to countermeasure. This is the leadership that Joseph exudes in this moment. And here's what we see. We see that God stands with Joseph through this entire sequence. Here's how. First, God provides for Joseph in the moment. Pharaoh rushes to fetch Joseph out of the dungeon. He shares the dreams. You can interpret them. Joseph declares, I'm not able to, but God's going to give you the answers here. And that's exactly what God does. And God not only supplies the interpretation for Joseph, but then he also supplies the plan. 
God uses Joseph here in this moment, the most pivotal moment of his life. He is honest with Pharaoh. I have no answers. But what we see is that God provides him with the answers, not just for the interpretation, but even for how to lead the land through the most ritual, the treacherous times that the land would ever see. God provides for Joseph. And then secondly, God is present with Joseph. Look, not just here, but in every moment. We see it here in verse 38. Pharaoh, after he responds to the proposal, says, can anyone like this, can we find anyone like this, a man who has God's spirit in him? Look, through Throughout all of Joseph's ups and downs, the thing that is continually said about him is that God was with Joseph. When Joseph's brothers betrayed him, God was with Joseph. Whenever Joseph was sold into slavery into Potiphar's house, God was with Joseph. Whenever Joseph was wrongfully accused and thrown into prison, God was with Joseph. As Joseph rose up in the prison and everything was entrusted to his authority, it was said that God was with Joseph. And even as he's forgotten, God does not forget him. God is with Joseph through it all. God stands with Joseph. So look, here's what this means for us. As we look at the life of Joseph, here's what God is telling us. You can trust God with the right now. You can trust God with your present. You can trust God with the challenges in your home right now. You can trust God with the difficulties at your workplace Right now, you can trust God with the rocky relationships that you don't know the path, you don't know how to make reconciliation, you don't know how to mend it back together. You can trust God with the rocky relationships right now because look, God stands with you. The same assurances that we see in Joseph's life are said of us, those that trust in Jesus as well. The Bible is clear that God is with you. At Jesus' ascension, as he's about to break through the clouds, he issues several commands. You see this in the verbs of the passage. He says, go, make disciples of all nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And then teach them everything that I've told you. All of these instructions, all of these commands, he gives one promise. Remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Here's the good news for you, Christian. God couldn't be nearer to you. Here's what Jesus says in the upper room before his crucifixion, John 14, 23. If anyone loves me, He will keep my word. My father will love him. And we will come to him and make our home with him. When you trust in Jesus, through the gift of the Holy Spirit, God comes up to you and sets up his permanent residence in your life. When you are gifted with the Holy Spirit, it's as if God takes his mailbox, puts it into the ground, pours in cement and says, this is where I live. That's how, God, that's how close God is with you. He couldn't be near. But secondly, God provides for you. We see this throughout all the New Testament. Jesus assures us that God provides for us generally and spiritually. He assures us in Matthew 6 that he provides for everything that we need. He compares us to the birds of the sky and the flowers of the field. And he says, aren't you worthy, worth more than both of these? So don't worry about your life. Jesus is saying, I've got you. you. You're the one that bears my image. You are created in my image. If I care for the birds of the sky and I care for the lilies of the field... I'm going to care for you. But then he also says this spiritually as well. Paul assures us that 
God gifts us spiritually to do the work of the church. As he, Jesus, as he's about to ascend and he calls us to the Great Commission to go out and to make disciples and to baptize and to teach, Paul assures us that God gifts us with the Holy Spirit to carry out the work that he's called us to do. You see this in Romans chapter 12. What we see is some are gifted to serve, to tend to the cares of other people. Some are gifted to teach, to help others grow in the mind of Christ. Some are gifted financially so that they can care for the least of those that are amongst us. Some are gifted to lead in order to give guidance and direction to God's people. Some are gifted with mercy to advocate for the marginalized in society. What God has called you to do, he's equipped you to do. He's gifted you. He provides for you, generally and spiritually. Everything that you see assurance-wise with Joseph here in this particular passage, you have it in spades. God stands with you. You can trust him right now. Steve Cuss, I think, says it well. Worry is like a rocking chair. It will give you something to do but it won't take you anywhere. You can trust him. Not only does God go before Joseph, and not only does God stand with Joseph, we also see that God walks behind Joseph. Here's what verses 50 through 57 say. Two sons were born to Joseph before the years of famine arrived. Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, a priest at On, bore them to him. This is the wife that Pharaoh gave him. Joseph named the firstborn Manasseh, which is a Hebrew name, and said, God has made me forget all my hardships and my whole family. And then the second son he named Ephraim, which is also a Hebrew name, and said, God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. Then the seven years of abundance in the land of Egypt came to an end. The seven years of famine began. Just as Joseph had said, there was famine in every land, but in the whole land of Egypt there was food. And when the whole land of Egypt was stricken with famine, the people cried out to Pharaoh for food. Pharaoh told all Egypt, go to Joseph. Do whatever he tells you. And now the famine had spread across the whole region. And so Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold grain to the Egyptians, for the famine was severe in the land of Egypt. Every land came to Joseph in Egypt. Do you recognize that? They don't come to Pharaoh, do they? They come to Joseph. Every land came to Joseph in Egypt to buy grain, for the famine was severe in every land. Look, we see that God walks behind Joseph here. He... He supplies, he brings all the promises to fruition in David's life. And then through the naming of his two sons, we see that God walks behind Joseph. Here's what Manasseh means. God has made me forget all my hardship and my whole family. Ephraim, God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. This is Joseph's way of acknowledging God's hand and all he has endured. Through naming his two sons this, I've forgotten my hardship. The 13 years of enduring the lowest points that I could never have come up with in my wildest of dreams. God has caused me to forget that and the heartbreak that my family inflicted on my whole entire life. And then through Ephraim, or through all that God is doing, he names Ephraim and he looks at all of this and he looks... God has fulfilled everything that he told me he was going to do. He's made me fruitful even in the land of my affliction. Joseph looks in the rearview mirror and sees God's handiwork because God walks behind Joseph. Here's what you need to see through Joseph's story. You can trust God with your past. You can trust God with your future. You can trust God with your right now and your present, and you can trust God with your past because look, since God is the one that has been at work through all of Joseph's life, as he looks back, he gets clarity on all that God is doing, and he can see that through every step in 
hard situation in his life and each provision, it's all come at the hands of God. Essentially what Joseph is saying is, I see that God brought me all the way home. He brought me through all of it. And the same thing that God does for Joseph, he does for you and me. The Bible says we'll be able to look back with the similar clarity at Christ's return. When Jesus comes back for us, the call is, or the, the promise is that when we look back, we'll understand everything that God has been doing in our life. And the call for us right now is to endure, to run the race, to keep going. 1 Thessalonians 5, 24 says this, that as we're in the midst of like chasing after Jesus, keeping our eyes set on Jesus, not understanding what God is doing in our present, not even understanding how things are going to work out in our future. But whenever we stand before Jesus and we look back on all that, here's what the promise that we cling to is. He who calls you is faithful. He will do it. We'll be like Joseph on that day that Christ returns, that we look back and we have 2020 vision on all that God has been doing in our life and all the ways that he's been working to bring us all the way home. There's a, a story by, uh, about Charlton Heston um, whenever he was shooting a movie that I think depicts this so well. So Ben-Hur, he was in this movie, Ben-Hur, there's this epic chariot race that happens in Ben-Hur. And so Heston has to go learn how to drive a horse cart in order to participate in this scene within the movie. And as he's getting ready for this movie, he realizes that the seven other teams that he has to go up against are professionals. So he's learned how to drive the horse cart, but he's nervous because he knows he can't compete with the seven other professionals that he's racing against in the particular scene. And so he goes to the director to express his concern. And so Heston says this, I can drive the cart, but I can't make it win. And the director tells him back, just stay in the race and I'll make sure you win. This is the promise of Jesus. You keep going. Not perfection. You are clinging to the hope of Jesus. There's going to be faltering. You're going to fall. You're going to stumble. You're going to mess up. There's going to be wrongs in your life, but keep holding on to the hope that you have in Jesus, the grace that defines your life. Turn to nothing else. And look, if you do that, what you'll look back at Jesus' return is that throughout all of it, it's actually Jesus that's just bringing you all the way home. He's the one that makes you win. God is faithful. Through Joseph's life, we see that God's faithfulness, it's real. It's not just some pie in the sky, imaginative thing. It is real. However, it is in Jesus' life that we see God's faithfulness, faithfulness is definitive. In Joseph's life, we see it's real. In Jesus' life, we see it's definitive. The Bible says of Jesus that all of God's promises are yes and amen in him. Everything that God has promised would happen in terms of your good have happened in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. In Jesus, we see that God has gone before us. In Jesus, we see that God stands with us. In Jesus, we see that God walks behind us. Jesus has gone ahead of us. He's preparing a place for you right now. He's preparing for you to be with God the Father and himself and all the saints for eternity right now. He has you in mind. Jesus stands with you through the Holy Spirit who lives in you right now. It can never be taken away from you. No matter how threatening life gets, there is something that can never be stolen from you. It is the presence of God in your life. Jesus walks behind you. He's the one that brings you all the way home. And here's how good our God is. 
he gives us two practices in the church to remember and to celebrate God's faithfulness even today through practices that we're going to do tonight. Through the practice of baptism and through communion, we are reminded that God goes before us, that God is with us, and that God walks behind us. Baptism is the drama or it's the theater group (laughs) of the entire church. What happens in baptism is our union with Christ is depicted to everyone in the room. It does not save a person, but it does give the vivid depiction of our being buried with Christ and raised to new life. As the person goes down into the waters, it's as if they're being lowered into the grave with Jesus after his crucifixion, but we don't keep them in the water. They come back out. We are united with Jesus in his resurrection. What happened to Christ in baptism, we're declaring that that's our future reality. We've experienced it in part. It's going to be our hope in the future. In communion, we have the meal of celebration and thanksgiving that we have fellowship with God. That he has done the complete work that is necessary for us to have a right relationship with him. By eating the bread, we acknowledge that Jesus' body was broken on the cross for us. He died in your place. By taking of the cup, You're reminded that Jesus spilt his own blood. God spilt his blood for you so that you might spend eternity with him. All Jesus gets is your sin, and all we get is his righteousness, his perfect standing. We're reminded of this every single time that we take communion. We trust in Christ's death in our place, and we experience fellowship with God. As we do, may you be reminded that God is faithful to you. Can I trust God? He goes before you. He stands with you. He walks behind you. And God made that definitive in Christ Jesus for you. Amen. Let's pray.